I'm going to take you to Dick Cheney, fasten your seatbelt, and this is going to absolutely blow you away. I would like you, if, you're, if you can do this on your computer, to go to methodicaldeception.com, and when you open that up on the navigation bar, you'll see where it says resources, and you'll want to click on that resources. And then um, there's a big box that says about the Israeli art students at the World Trade Center. Click here. Click on that and tell me when you get to that page that has some photographs because this is the elephant in the room that nobody wanted to talk about. And this is one of the documents, a 60-61-page DEA document that I went over and over and over and connected Israeli Mossad bomb experts to an art group that were traveling around the United States and to an art group that gave themselves the name of Gelatin. So are you there? I'm there. Uh, so you got those pictures? Yeah. Okay, now I'm going to take you to Dick Cheney. Just listen up. You're looking at those pictures. Those are some Israeli art students that came from a foreign country, and their art project was called B Thing. They called their team the Gelatin group and just so you understand this gelatin is often referred to a uh, gelignite or blasting gelatin it's also referred to as blasting jelly but gelatin and they later later on changed their name because they people started waking up to this so they named their name their name gelatin they called their art projects the B thing and you will see on the left hand side a photograph of the title page of their book and what the B thing was there was a, a group called the Lower Manhattan Cultural Center that was renting the 91st floor or allowed to live on the 91st floor. These foreign art students and some of them were connected to a group of traveling art students that were all over the country that the DEA found out about because they were going door to door to some of their agents' homes and their offices. And some of the offices were not public locations. So they were like, who are these people? There's Israeli students trying to sell us art. This was just a smokescreen. So you wouldn't go to where we're about to go. Now the guy in the pink shirt, he's on the top right hand side. Yep. Kind of a pink shirt on. He has repelling gear on. Yeah. They removed a window. This was their art project. They put a wooden balcony out and they had photographs taken via a helicopter that was rented by their sponsor from the Lower Manhattan Cultural Center. And that particular gentleman also had a big party to celebrate this event and he rented part of the top floors of the Millennium Hotel, you'll remember that from 9-11, and who was there, the Bush uh, relative, and uh, took pictures and had a big uh, champagne party watching this, okay? Look behind the gentleman in the pink shirt. You're going to see two big bold numbers. It says BB-18. Those are fuse holders. Now look at all three pictures and look at how many boxes of plastic fuse holders that can be used for remote control demolition. And ask yourself, why would art students from Israel and Austria be having thousands of fuse holders? This building was built in the early 1970s. They weren't electricians. They weren't redoing all of the electricity in that building. You know, think about this. Okay, so I get this book out, I'm waiting for my shipment of books to show up, and I literally had a voice say to me, look into this. Those fuses, by the way, come from a company called Lytel Fuse, L-I-T-T-E-L, -T -T -E Fuse Company. They're located in Chicago. And some little voice said to me, take a look into this Lytel Fuse Company, where all of those fuse holders behind those artists are. And now some of those artists are guaranteed Mossad bomb experts and that's in the DEA document that you can read. So I find out that Lytel Company is a subsidiary of a corporation called Tracor, T-R-A-C-O-R. Now Tracor, they went bankrupt and split their company. They were a government contractor. They split them off into Tracor Aviation, Lytel Fuse and Tracor Defense Holdings. They're based in Austin, Texas. 
They were bought out by Westmark Systems. Bobby Ray Inman was the chairman of the Westmark at a point. Then Westmark kind of started losing it, and Tracor bought them back. Tracor bought out a company called Vitro, which used to be the Kellex Company. Let me tell you about Kellex Company. The Kellex Corporation was whole, a wholly owned subsidiary of M. W. Kellogg, as in cereal, you know that guy, Kellogg, company. Kellex was formed in 1942 that the so Kellogg's operation relating to the Manhattan Project could be kept separate and secret. Kell meaning Kellogg and X meaning secret. The new company's goal was to design a facility for the production of enrichment, enriched uranium through a gaseous diffusion technique. In gaseous diffusion, isotopes of uranium-235 could be separated from uranium-238 by turning uranium metal into uranium hexafluoride gas and straining it through a barrier material. Now, this is kind of interesting, too, so for those of you who remember that originally uh, the first responders were getting calls that there was a missile launch from the Woolworth building. The newly formed Kellex Company's original headquarters were in the Woolworth building in Lower Manhattan. I know, it's just another coincidence, isn't it? <laughs> they later on moved to Oak Ridge, Tennessee. But now, the Kellex Company, you will know them today. Here we are, fasten your seatbelts as Halliburton. Dick Cheney's old company. There you go. I told you I was going to take you to Dick Cheney. And word late tonight that two suspects are in FBI custody after a truckload of explosives was discovered around the George Washington Bridge. That bridge uh, links uh, New York to New Jersey over the Hudson River. Whether the discovery of those explosives had anything to do with other events of the day is unclear, but the FBI has two suspects in hand, said the truck uh, load of explosives, that enough explosives were in the truck to do great damage to the George Washington Bridge. But they arrested the two suspects and they're questioning him as we speak. We see John Miller. I gather has just heard of an incident in New Jersey. Uh, the New York City Police Department has a report that the FBI is responding to New Jersey because a truck reportedly uh, loaded with explosives has been stopped by authorities on the road there and um, the men with that truck have been detained. Uh, members of the Joint Terrorist Task Force, according to the New York police officials, are responding to question those people. Um, I want to underline that uh, all the phones uh, to police headquarters and to the FBI uh, from here seem to be disabled. So uh, sorting through these reports to get specifics, um, to sort them out can sometimes take time, but this is information that is in the possession of the police department, comes from the FBI, and uh, we don't know the exact significance of it. Okay, thanks very much, gentlemen. I guess it's also clear to people now that ABC News is going to stay on the air for an indefinite, indefinite period of time of the people we asked. Good evening, everyone. I'm Diana Williams with Bill Ritter. We interrupt ABC's coverage right now because we have late-breaking information about an incident at the George Washington They're Bridge. Signed into a Commissioner check Bernard Kerrigan and NYPD talking emergency. now. Let's listen in. Uh, thereby closing down 14th Street South in Southern Manhattan. Um, this will include or relate to all pedestrian and vehicle air traffic except essential emergency vehicles and personnel shall be prohibited in the following areas Manhattan south of 14th Street and that will be from East River to the Hudson River um, the only vehicles that will be allowed in those areas will be emergency vehicles uh, police fire vehicles National Guard and anything authorized by the police department. There will be some vehicles in the morning that will have to get down there for deliveries of certain things that we're familiar with already. They will be allowed in and residents, that's it. Um, anyone uh, trying to violate the order uh, will be uh, arrested and uh, could be found guilty of a class B misdemeanor. Uh, I urge 
people to follow uh, the order. Uh, there's no need to come into southern Manhattan tomorrow. Uh, and as a result of the order, um, the best thing to do is stay away. Can you talk, can you talk about this incident that came up on Channel 2 about the, some people coming across the Brooklyn and the uh, GW Bridge explosives? Can you comment on that at all? Well, I haven't seen the report and uh, I, I haven't heard about anybody coming across the bridge with explosives. Okay. Have you heard anything about the ban on the Justice Act? Well, I've heard the, basically the same thing you have. We haven't been able to confirm it yet. Um, they weren't near the bridge, to my understanding. Uh, if it in fact did happen, we're trying to confirm it through our detective bureau. One more question on this. South of 14th Street, that includes all bridges and tunnel crossing south of 14th Street. Those are closed down for people. Any movement south of 14th Street. And you have not heard about any explosives on the George Washington Bridge or no. in the Lincoln Tunnel? No. Commissioner, Thank you. Commissioner, it was in Jersey near uh, the bridge. Is that your understanding? Do you know the jurisdiction? Well, it, it, what we heard, what we, listen, what we heard was Port Authority police stopped a van that might have had explosives in it. Uh, we haven't been able to confirm it yet. We're working on it. Uh, when we hear something, we'll let you know. That's on the Jersey side. Right? It's on the Jersey side. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And we'll, we'll be back. So, so we don't have to go through okay. this. How long? How long? I'm hopeful. Okay, what, what you have just seen there is Police Commissioner Bernard Carrick not confirming any reports at this point. Reports that we have heard that there was a truck loaded with possibly explosives uh, near the vicinity of the George Washington Bridge. And he said that those reports have not been confirmed. The police they Department are checking on it right now. You heard John Miller uh, tell Peter Jennings that he too had heard this from Port Authority sources. Again, com Police Commissioner Bernard Carrick not confirming that anything had happened or any threat to the George Washington Bridge. We'll keep, of course keep you posted. We're going to well, thank you. And again, our apologies to our viewers about five minutes ago, but we do have uh, an established connection now with seeing as Deborah Fabrick. The reports we're getting now, two or three men arrested on the New Jersey Parkway. Deborah, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Uh, that is the information that I'm getting from two sources, that there was a van either on the New Jersey Turnpike or the Garden State Parkway, and that it was near the George Washington Bridge. There were two or three men who were in the van. The van was pulled over. Uh, it is not clear why the van was pulled over, but when it was, uh, law enforcers found uh, uh, tons of explosives inside of the van. That is right now all I'm hearing, um, but again, two to three people uh, in custody, and we are trying to get more information on that right now. Deborah, I don't mean to put you on the spot here. Do you know where on the Jersey Turnpike this was? How far from New York City? Um, we do not know that. We are looking into that. There is one report that it was on the New Jersey Turnpike. There is another report uh, that it was uh, very close to the bridge, if not on the bridge. So again, these details all emerging, and we're trying to uh, piece them together. Uh, but that's what we've got so far. Two to three people uh, in custody right now uh, found with a van filled with explosives. All right, well understood. Um, the other report that we wanted to ask you about uh, earlier, we had heard that an FBI spokesperson said that there was a report on the George Washington Bridge, which is another facility which you folks are responsible for policing, uh, a report that there had been a van uh, stopped there that had explosives. Have uh, you, uh, the Port Authority Police down here, heard anything about that? I have received no reports on that particular incident, and there's nothing that has been brought to our attention to that effect. It is hard to conceive, but three days ago, both World Trade Towers rose 1,362 feet into the sky. Visit those same towers today. At their tallest point, they rise maybe a hundred feet above the street. And while it's true there are six floors below street level, now filled with debris, engineers at the firm that built the building's best guess to account for the missing 1,200 feet of material from each tower is that large portions simply vaporized into the dust that rained down on New Yorkers immediately after the collapse. It was that powerful. We're talking here about 43,600 windows, 600,000 square feet of glass, 200,000 tons of structural steel, 5 million square feet of gypsum, 6 acres of marble, and 425,000 cubic yards of concrete, turned in good part into a cloud, says environmental medical doctor Stephen Levin. I was astonished at the degree to which solid materials were turned into pulverized dust as a consequence of that building collapse. I think it was striking. 
The Environmental Protection Agency has been sampling the dust, and one specialist told ABC they believe the clouds that appeared immediately after the collapse were mostly gypsum dust from drywall, cement dust, and plaster, which can cause problems. Cement dust is an irritant. Fine glass powder is also an irritating material. The EPA did find spotty levels of asbestos. A sample on a police car turned out dangerous. Another sample a couple of blocks away, not dangerous. But most interesting, in the mix, they are looking, they think, at specks of steel that used to be beams and elevators, marble from the lobby floor and facings. So what were once the strongest architectural elements in the two towers were pulverized. Large portions turned into clouds like this one. Still, there is this mystery. If some of the hardest materials were vaporized, how to account for the presence everywhere of paper? Fully intact letters, business forms, stationery. Paper is so fragile and combustible, and yet somehow, maybe because we have so much of it, it was everywhere. Robert Krulwich, ABC News, New York. One of the things that's very suspicious is the fact they hauled away the steel so quickly. So, uh, but has anybody ever done an analysis for the he heavy neutron activated isotopes in iron? Okay, I have a piece of the iron yeah. that, from the World Trade Center. This was uh, left over from a monument that was put together. Good. Uh, and I have that, and it's bent. It's, it's quite heavily so, bent. So, you, by bent, do you think it was physically bent from a physical wrenching, or was it bent from like a thermal pulse or something? I showed it to a machinist. It's hard to tell. But it's clearly, it's clearly, no, it's an it angle iron and it's clearly opened. You know. What you want to do is you want to have a piece of metal that looks like it was literally cooked. Like those, that girder fry you see in the pictures. That it does have some uh, residue yeah. on it. So I don't yeah, know yeah, in other words, it looks like it was cooked either by high pressure, very hot temperature thermate, you know, like you talked about, or the idea of a thermal pulse from a, from a, a mini nuclear or a conventional weapon. You'd want to see if there's neutron activation, because I only think a percentage of the actual debris of the building would be acceptable to the test, really? which is why my guess is less than 10% of the material that, that we would see would probably be samples of area where, where that might have occurred. That's an interesting approach. Well, in any case, this is... Uh, yeah, so it's yeah, worth, worth testing it, yeah. And, and I did uh, look, just, I'm not saying this is the most sophisticated test, certainly, yeah. but I'd looked with Geiger counter. And this is about, uh, gosh, it was last year. Yeah, most of the isotopes, though, and, are going to be stable, non-radioactive. I guess you know the answer. It's in my paper again. Yeah, they're going to be stable, no, non-radioactive. There was no radioactivity yeah, in this iron, this steel, from the World Trade Center yeah. that had been heavily damaged. And, and indeed, there was a, a flow of uh, material on it. So right. I, I would say yeah. this was a But the heavy example. isotopes are not radioactive. There was, there was nothing yeah. about background. And the, the results are, the numerical results are given yeah. in my paper. There. So I encourage you to read yeah, that. Yeah, no, they, one of the things about iron uh, neutron activation is only a very tiny amount of the isotopes and it has a relatively short half-life are going to be radioactive. The stable ones like iron-58 are not radioactive so, at all. So the point is, I summarized in my paper uh, yeah. various uh, studies that had already looked for radioisotopes, including iodine-131, alpha, gamma, and beta emitters. And, uh, of course, for myself, I looked at the steel and the dust sample right. that I have from Jeanette McKinley. Right. So it would be interesting if you see something that I missed. What we're going to be possible. doing is we're, we're using a technology because we just And, and that others sure. missed, too. Yeah, we also have to use the right technology, too, because we're going to be looking for stable isotopes that are above background by a margin wide enough to see if it shows the isotope ratios that would indicate that there was enough mixing because um, that pyroplastic cloud is going to be spreading and mixing, and also yeah, enough isotopes. What, what, why are you looking at the stable isotopes? I'm no, we're, we're looking for these these ones like the higher and heavier isotopes, like you know the ones like uh, like uh, beryllium nine and ten, um, you know uh, niobium uh, ninety four and uh, cobalt fifty nine and sixty. Well, cobalt sixty would be particularly interesting. Yeah, that'll be interesting. I think but again, it on what was there. If we find the heavy isotopes of beryllium, that's going to be a, a real clincher because beryllium. Is, is, is rare to see other than in places like, uh, uh, you know, around a nuclear device. Okay. Now, so we, we need to underline that you're looking. That's good. Right. But the results are not yet in. Oh, no. Okay. And we'll see. So, and we're, and we're, getting, we're, we're planning on running uh, probably at least three samples. And From my classified sources, which are also confirmed by Alan Sadowski, that the World Trade Center towers were demolished with both thermite cutting the outside the joists of the building, because the building was created as the first building in the world of this type of construction, the World Trade Center 1 and 2, 
where it was suspended from the outside like a cage and also from the center core. The center core was vaporized with a chain of pearls of dialable micro-nukes. U.S. Army Corps engineers placed there by Israeli Mossad, which, by the way, it's not because it's the Jews. They're just the trigger finger or the hitman on the hand of the CIA. And the outside were cut with therm super thermite charges used to cut the joists. Uh, a third of the mass of the building was turned into atomic vapor, which only could do that, including the vaporization of the radio tower, if it was vaporized at hundreds of thousands of degrees for microseconds, which literally could turn into an atomic vapor. So a third of the mass of the building was turned into a vapor. Uh, it's telling that I've been trying for six, seven years now to do radioactive testing using plasma neutron spectroscopy, not only here but in Europe, and I was told repeatedly that even when I requested it in Germany, and Britain, that I would be reported to the Department of, of Defense and arrested if I t tried to do the testing. I've tried even people like Dr. Asaf Jurakovic, who when we were trying to do the testing, the uh, powers that be even disappeared with his children. And Dr. Jurakovic was struck with a Special Forces team that hit him in his Ontario, Canada home because he had a home outside Washington, D.C. He's been in the military, in the U.S. military for years. He is... Uh, a triple specialist in radiation and radiochemistry and nuclear toxicology. And uh, we were doing work through the Uranium Metals Research Council for vets from not only Kosovo, Yugoslavia, uh, but also from Iraq and now Afghanistan on the exposure of our troops and also the people in these countries to depleted uranium weapons. And believe me, you wouldn't believe how aggressive these countries are coming after us for even requesting the testing. I remember getting a call from the uh, fire department commander telling me that they were not sure they were going to be able to contain the fire. And I said, you know, we've had such terrible loss of life. Maybe the smartest thing to do is, is pull it. Uh, and they made that decision to pull. And then we watched the building collapse. I remember getting a call from the uh, fire department commander telling me that they were not sure they were going to be able to contain the fire. And I said, you know, we've had such terrible loss of life. Maybe the smartest thing to do is, is pull it. Uh, and they made that decision to pull. And then we watched the building collapse. Six and seventh on King Street. 
Oh, I'll send this unit bus right there for Westgate. With a mural painted. Uh, airplane diving into New York, blowing up. Two men got out of the truck, ran away from it. We got those two boots on the... That's good. Apologies to our viewers about five minutes ago, but we do have uh, an established connection now with seen as Deborah Ferry. The reports we're getting now, two or three men arrested on the New Jersey Parkway. Deborah, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Uh, that is the information that I'm getting from two sources, that there was a van either on the New Jersey Turnpike or the Garden State Parkway, and that it was near the George Washington Bridge. There were two or three men who were in the van. The van was pulled over. Uh, it is not clear why the van was pulled over, but when it was, uh, law enforcers found uh, uh, tons of explosives inside of the van. That is right now all I'm hearing, um, but again, two to three people uh, in custody, and we are trying to get more information on that right now. Deborah, I don't mean to put you on the spot here. Do you know where on the Jersey Turnpike this was? How far from New York City? Um, we do not know that. We are looking into that. There is one report that it on the New Jersey Turnpike. There is another report uh, that it was uh, very close to the bridge, if not on the bridge. So again, these details are all emerging, and we're trying to uh, piece them together. Uh, but that's what we've got so far. Two to three people uh, in custody right now uh, found with a van filled with explosives. All right, well understood. So Deborah, where are you tonight? And we're late tonight that two suspects are in FBI custody after a truckload of explosives was discovered around the George Washington Bridge. That bridge uh, links uh, New York to New Jersey over the Hudson River. Whether the discovery of those explosives has anything to do with other events of the day is unclear, but the FBI has two suspects in hand, said the truck uh, load of explosives, enough explosives were in the truck to do great damage to the George Washington Bridge. But they arrested the two suspects and they're questioning them as we speak. And all of a sudden, down there, I see this van park, and I see three guys on top of the van, and I could see that they were like happy. You know, they 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 were they didn't look shocked to me. You know, they didn't look shocked. I thought it was very strange. We had received an all points bulletin, and uh, I just happened to see the van, and you know, hollered over to my lieutenant. You know, I think that could be the van. We checked it out, and it was. You know, we were all on edge, obviously, so I really wasn't looking to make friends with these people, and neither were the officers that I were with. Once we started talking to them, you know, they were pretty much like, hey, you know, we're, you know, we're not against you, we're with you. And at that point, we were taken for another round of questioning, this time related to our allegedly being members of Mossad. The fact of the matter is, we are coming from a country that experiences terror daily. Our purpose was to document the event. Our purpose was to document the event. I was watching the towers, and though I wasn't the closest, I saw them crumble to the earth like they were full of explosives. And they thought nobody noticed the news report that they did about the bombs planted on the George Washington Bridge. Four non-Arabs arrested during the emergency, and then it disappeared from the news permanently. They dubbed the tape of Osama, and they said it was proof. Jealous of our freedom, I can't believe you bought that excuse. Rocking a motherfucking flag don't make you a hero. We're the ground zero, the devil crept into heaven, God overslept on the 7th, the new world order was born on September 11th. Father forgive them for they don't know right from wrong, the truth is set you free written down in the song, and the song has the cause of death written in cold, the word of God brought to light that has saved your soul, save your soul motherfucker, save your soul. 
just so conservatives don't take it to heart. I don't think Bush did it because he isn't that smart. It has been more than 16 years since a civilian working for the Navy was charged with passing secrets to Israel. Jonathan Pollard pled guilty to conspiracy to commit espionage and is serving a life sentence. At first, Israeli leaders claimed Pollard was part of a rogue operation, but later took responsibility for his work. Now Fox News has learned some U.S. investigators believe that there are Israelis again very much engaged in spying in and on the U.S., who may have known things they didn't tell us before September 11th. Fox News correspondent Carl Cameron has details in the first of a four-part series. Since September 11th, more than 60 Israelis have been arrested or detained, either under the new Patriot anti-terrorism law or for immigration violations. A handful of active Israeli military were among those detained, according to investigators, who say some of the detainees also failed polygraph questions when asked about alleged surveillance activities against and in the United States. There is no indication... Can you believe what you have been seeing on CNN today, ladies and gentlemen? Can you believe it? <laughs> Supposedly, a CNN reporter found Osama bin Laden, took a television camera crew with him, went into Osama bin Laden's hideout, interviewed him and his top leadership, his top lieutenants and colonels and generals, in their hideout. This is a CNN reporter with a camera crew. And he came out and told everybody, within three weeks, Osama bin Laden is going to attack the United States and Israel. Now, don't you think that's kind of strange, folks? You see, because the largest intelligence apparatus in the world, with the biggest budget in the history of the world, has been looking for Osama bin Laden for years and years and years and can't find him. The FBI also, under the leadership of Louis Free, has been looking for Osama bin Laden for years and years and years and years and years and many years and can't find him. Some doofus jerk-off reporter with a camera crew waltzes right into his hideout and interviews him. And you know what his budget is? <laughs> Zip, zilch, nothing. Now, that tells us two things. Either everyone in the intelligence community and all of the intelligence agencies of the United States government are blithering idiots and incompetent fools, including the entire apparatus of the FBI and all of their personnel, or they're lying to us. They're not looking for him at all. And the second is the truth. You see, the CIA created Osama bin Laden. They recruited him. They trained him. They found his leadership. They brought them all together. They showed him them how to fight the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. And when that was over, they still continued to fund him and train him, and they're now using him to help bring about world government by making him the big boogeyman because they can't use Saddam Hussein anymore. Because they needed a new boogeyman. A reporter from CNN and his little camera crew got in to Osama bin Laden's secret hideout and conducted an interview. If you don't believe me, tune in to CNN. They're probably running it right now as I'm speaking. And if you believe it, you are one of the stupidest jerks that ever lived on the face of this earth. And whatever is going to happen that they're going to blame on Osama bin Laden, don't you even believe it.
heard them say that a paper passport fell out of one of the towers and was picked up by a police officer on the street. This plane flies into the building, explodes with jet fuel out of the guy's jacket, goes through the fireball, through the side of the plane, out of the burning building, out of the fire shooting out, and comes down to the ground unscathed. But something happened. For six months they reported they had this passport. Boy, we've got it. We've got the proof. And then the guy stood up and was alive in the Middle East, and they pulled it and said, oh, that was a mistake. He wasn't a hijacker, and the story just disappeared. So what about the hijackers? It's the funniest thing, but at least nine of them are still alive. Walid Al-Sheri is a Saudi Airlines pilot in Casablanca, Morocco. Whale M. Al-Sheri is alive and well. Abdulaziz Alamari is a Saudi Airlines pilot living in Saudi Arabia. Mohand Al-Sheri is alive in Saudi Arabia. Khalid Al-Madar is a computer programmer in Mecca. Salam Al-Hamzi works at a chemical plant in Yanbo, Saudi Arabia. Saeed Al-Ghamdi is training to be a pilot in Tunis. Ahmed Al-Nami is an administrative supervisor for Saudi Airlines. And last but not least, Mohammed Atta's father claimed to receive a phone call from his son on September 12th. Fourteen of the hijackers based their training in Florida, and the five that allegedly hijacked Flight 77 lived in a motel right outside the gates of the NSA. Not to mention the official autopsy report for Flight 77 does not list the hijackers. And the opening paragraph makes no mention of their absence. After these discrepancies were pointed out, FBI Director Robert Mueller brushed it off, saying that the hijackers were using stolen passports and may not have had tickets, so there's no way to know who they actually were. So, if there's no proof that the hijackers were members of Al-Qaeda, or if they were even on the plane in the first place, what justification do we have for bombing Afghanistan? We have a Republican here tonight who's uh, here to prove this is and should be a nonpartisan issue. I'd like to hear from Carl Schwartz, please. Carl. What they found inside the FBI actually came from ongoing drug investigations dating back to 1998. And I heard uh, the other day, uh, just a minute ago, Mr. Thompson brought up Argentina, the company that had the contract with the Taliban is Brightest Corporation. They are from Argentina. On September 9, 2003, they won a lawsuit in our Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. They had been tied up in the Texas courts since 1996. They won $500 million in a judgment for interference of contract in Turkmenistan. The only remaining thing was to take the Taliban and Brightus out. And then we control it all. We control the Caspian Basin oil. We have the pipeline to get it to the sea. The oil and gas in the Caspian Basin in current dollars is worth somewhere between 11 and $12 trillion. If you look at who was on the 9-11 Commission, on the Democrat side, who was directly benefiting, uh, Mr. Ben Venis's law firm was the law firm that kept Brightus tied up. They're also the law firm that lost the lawsuit uh, when it went to the Supreme Court and uh, the Fifth Circuit. They kept them tied up at least from 1998. They're involved in Pakistan, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, and Uzbekistan in about 20 different ways. Uh, you got the guy, Field, uh, no, Thompson, the Republican governor, former governor of Illinois. He is sitting on the board of FMC. They have an oil and gas subsidiary. They make equipment. They're selling a lot of it overseas in the Caspian. Jamie Gorlick, I thought she was going to be a go-getter. I mean, I was rooting for her because she acted like she knew what she was doing. Uh, she sits on the board of Schlumberger, which is a competitor to Halliburton. Just within two weeks prior to the 9-11 Commission saying Sani died and handing it over to the President and Congress to change our rights some more, which is what I think they plan to do, uh, Schlumberger finally comes forward and admits they're having record profits in this last quarter and they're doing a lot of big bucks business in the Caspian Basin. If you look at the reality that Bridus had a contract with the Taliban, we had landlocked oil and gas deals, we had to get it to the ocean, we had people actually doing business in Pakistan. You literally have to look at 9-11 and all of those foregoing issues as inseparable. There is your Pearl Harbor. 
I call them financial terrorists. I don't know what you would call them. It's been over a dozen years since the September 11th terror attacks. The American taxpayer has been built for trillions of dollars in an endless war on terror. Isn't it time that we find out the real perpetrators behind this attack? Stick around for Buzzsaw. Central Intelligence Agency. It was described by witnesses as... Christopher Boleyn used to be an investigative journalist for the American Free Press and more recently has written two books on solving 9-11. He's joining me today to discuss perhaps who the real suspects should be in investigating that crime. Christopher, thank you for joining us. Nice to be with you. Um, to start out, I think you know, we have to ask the basic question, which is, you know, I get asked that as well. Why do you believe that 9-11 is not what the mainstream media and the 9-11 Commission tells us to believe as an Al-Qaeda conspiracy perpetrated by 19 terrorist hijackers uh, on, an aer on airplanes, four airplanes that day? Well, it's very simple. Um, first, that uh, the crime of 9-11, in which 3,000 people were killed, was never really investigated as a crime. The evidence was destroyed, for example, the steel at Ground Zero, um, and what, what evidence that was remaining um, was not analyzed. So um, the person who was supposed to prosecute the crimes of 9-11 was Michael Sheratoff, Assistant Attorney General at the Department of Justice. And the, um, the FBI was supposed to provide him with the analysis of the evidence to prosecute the crimes. None of that ever happened. Rather, the steel um, from the World Trade Center was uh, sent to a couple of junkyards in New Jersey, cut into small pieces, mixed with other scrap, and sent to China. And it was sent to China at a time when the, the price of scrap steel was the lowest it had been in 50 years, which meant that just the cost of shipping it to China was eating up all their profit. Hmm. So this was, a, this, was a, this was a crime in which the evidence was destroyed, and that was done because an, an analysis of the evidence would have proven early on what we now know, that the buildings were exploded, the buildings were demolished with explosions, and uh, that the perpetrators were not, were not the Arabs on the airplanes, but the buildings themselves were wired for destruction. And 93% and of the people who died on 9-11 died in the Twin Towers. Well, so you said, for example, that there was a profit to be made by selling the scrap. Now, who exactly was that the owners of the Trade Center buildings that would make profit on that? Well, they called it recycling. And, and at the time it was going on in 2001 and 2002, the New York media pretended not to understand basically the chain of custody of who was in control, control of the evidence. But the evidence was first and foremost under the control of the Department of Justice and their sub-agency, the FBI. And John Ashcroft was Attorney General. His assistant was Michael Shertoff, an Israeli national, by the way. And so these people failed in their official duties to prosecute the crimes because they failed in investigating the crime. There was no investigation. So when you talk about the 9-11 Commission report or you talk about these um, building performance documents, these reports, these, these do not replace an official police investigation, a forensic investigation, which never happened. So the destruction of the evidence is itself a crime. And, and for that crime, you could hold John Ashcroft, Michael Sheratoff, and of course George Bush and Dick Cheney accountable because they served beneath him, beneath the government. Mm -hmm. So now we start with that question obviously being, okay, if the people that are supposed to be investigating this mm -hmm. are not properly investigating mm -hmm. it, does that indicate then a level of collusion? Exactly. Now my question then would be, at what point, I mean, you're at this point a journalist, mm -hmm. at what point do you start to say things are not unfolding properly to my, you know, to my mm -hmm. understanding, to my knowledge, my awareness of the, how the world should mm -hmm. work, that there's something else going on here, that there's perhaps a conspiracy at mm -hmm. work. At what point does that come into your head? I understood that um, in the first week. I was in New York City on September 11th, early in the morning. Um, I couldn't go to Washington, obviously, so we uh, turned around and went back across Pennsylvania. And as I started writing about it, when I got back to Chicago, um, a couple days later, I could see that the uh, the government and the media were avoiding two main things. They were avoiding the evidence of explosions in the World Trade Center, and they were um, ignoring and uh, omitting any discussion of these five dancing Israelis. And then these are the guys, these Israeli agents who were caught 
um, basically celebrating the collapse of the, the burning towers behind them in New Jersey. And then thirdly, about a, a week later, there came out this report about the instant messaging services of Odigo. It's an Israeli company that was based in, in Herzliya, Israel, and, and also in, near the World Trade Center. And some instant messages went out on this text messaging service, Israeli owned, that warned of, of an imminent catastrophe at the World Trade Center, Trade Center. And it was sent out about two hours before it actually happened. So like 6.45 local time, 6.30. But the thing is that the, the uh, vice president of the company in Israel, Alex Diamandis, he told, he, he told the media that the, the warnings were exact, precise to the minute. Meaning that 8.45, all hells get break loose at the World Trade Center, don't go there. Hmm. So those, those things in the first two weeks indicated to me that there was a cover up, that we were being told a false narrative, we were being, we were being given a false narrative, and that those, may, were, those were the main issues that were being omitted from discussion. Right. But that, that, that question about the text message service, mm -hmm. I mean, was that proven or was because obviously a lot of mainstream media says, oh, that was some, you know, r conspiracy rumor, anti-Semitic rumors that were spread. About no, the no, that, 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 was, that was printed in the New York Times, I think, and maybe in the Washington Post once, but then later in Haaretz in Israel. Um, and like I said, the, the, the uh, vice president of the company, Alex Diamandis, uh, spoke to Haaretz, I believe it was. Mm -hmm and said exactly what I just told you, that the, the warnings were precise to the minute. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I've had Juval Aviv, for example, right, mm -hmm. who was Mossad. He, um, you know, formerly Mossad, he told me that he had been with George Bush briefing him, um, especially at that time period. He was briefing the president on mm -hmm. a monthly basis, as he says. Mm -hmm. And he basically had briefed him a month in advance mm -hmm. about precisely this type of attack mm -hmm. unfolding. Now, mm -hmm. his claim, of course, was that Bush didn't, you know, heard it, really didn't take it seriously, or who knows what happened. I mean, mm -hmm. he would say that there, there, there was perhaps a shadow government at play. I won't, mm -hmm. get, I won't speak for him. But the point being that intelligence services were aware mm -hmm. of the plots taking place. Now, where, where do you think Mossad fits into this scheming of this event? Well, I use the term Mossad to refer to Israeli intelligence in general. Um, but it's a loose, it's, it's a, a, a loose use of the term because um, an, an, a, uh, an atrocity like 9-11 was planned, we, we, know, we now know it was planned decades in advance. And the first indications uh, and uh, projections, ideations of this idea came off, for example, in a movie by Arnon Milchan in 1978 called The Medusa Touch with Richard Burton, in which the, the climactic scene is a 747 flying into the Trans Am, or the Pan Am building. And then, uh, um, but uh, you, find, you find that the, at every point of the matrix, you find either an Israeli agent themselves or an, uh, a Sayan, uh, an American Jew who's, who's working for the state of Israel. And what we're talking about is we're talking about a very extreme bunch of people at the top of Israeli intelligence and Israeli military, like Netanyahu, who basically have a psychopathic version of the world, the world view. Mm -hmm. and, um, you have to understand that in Israel, in 1976, I think it was, the Likud coalition came to power. When the Likud coalition came to power, it basically brought the terrorist gangs of the 1940s into the, into the top of the government. And it was a very sad day in Israeli history because it, it brought these, these former terrorists like Begin, Shamir, and of course um, Ariel Sharon into power. And, and these are people who only know the use of terrorism. That's their modus operandi. And so, you know, when, when 2001 began, February, we had Ariel Sharon running Israel and George Bush running this country. It was a constellation made for disaster. I mean, we've had Paul Craig Roberts on this show, who was a uh, former assistant tre treasury um, secretary under Reagan. And he talks about the neocon faction. And he said, look, I mean, the neocons, who are obviously a lot of whom are actually joint Israeli US citizens, mm -hmm. right? This bunch um, were basically being, you know, they were in prison for their crimes f during the Iran Contra era under the first Bush, right? Mm -hmm. When Bush was running that operation as vice president. And then as president, he was able to pardon a lot of these guys, right? Mm -hmm. Guys like Poindexter and Abrams. Mm -hmm. um, but the point being that this t same crew mm -hmm. that's running operations in the 80s mm -hmm. is now all of a sudden given another carte blanche access to Precisely. the presidency through Bush Jr., part two. Precisely. You know, and Ariel Sharon was the uh, Israeli defense minister when they invaded uh, Lebanon in 1982. And the atrocity of the massacre in Sabra and Shatila 
was blamed on him by a commission in Israel, the Kahana Commission. And it, um, the Kahana Commission took away, recommended that he lose his portfolio as Minister of Defense, which was taken away. And they also recommended that, recommended that he never serve in an Israeli government again. But in 2001, he was elected. And, you know, we saw what, we saw what, what um, Ariel Sharon was all about when he went up on the, temple, on the Temple Dome with a bunch of soldiers and basically started an intifada. He started an uprising all by himself. Because this is a man who thrives on, on, on terrorism and tension and war. And that's basically what is, that's who's been running Israel since 1976, basically, is these people. And, you know, Menachem Begin, who was the founder of the Likud party, um, who took Israel into the war in Lebanon, was also the, the person who bombed the King David Hotel in July 1946. And that's very similar to 9-11 because um, the reason they bombed the King David Hotel is because it was British headquarters in Mandate Palestine. And the British had gone out on an operation and collected a lot of evidence and, and the, previous to that. And they had, they had information that would have hanged the leaders of the, of the, of the issue, of the leaders of the uh, Jewish community in Palestine, mm -hmm. the Zionist committee. The, and even the Jewish agency was implicated in the evidence. So they had to destroy the King David Hotel in order to destroy the evidence. Right. And they have the same thing on 9-11. You have, you have the destruction, for example, of Building 6, the Customs House, where the vault down below the building, where all the evidence from the Enron, Enron crime and the uh, WorldCom and, and various gold financial scandals and just all kinds of things like that, big crimes are being investigated by the federal government. That evidence was carted off the night before. As we know from Kurt Sonnenfeld, who was a videographer for FEMA, the vault was empty. And Building 6 has a giant crater in the middle of it. It's an eight-story building, but it has a giant crater that goes down to the sub-basement level. And the, NY, the New York Fire Department was trying to fight that fire and contain that, that, that fire before the towers even fell. Mm -hmm. So you see, when you talk about 9-11, you're talking about a crime within a crime within a crime. Very much, very much like those uh, Russian Madryoshka dolls, mm -hmm. where you open up the doll, there's another doll inside, another doll. It's the same way. There's layers of deception, and there's crimes within crimes. So you mentioned, obviously, um, this film, you know, that was Milshan produced. Uh, ironically enough, he's won the Oscars last two years in mm -hmm. a row. Um, and he's been, and that actually happened after he admitted to being a notorious uh, arms dealer who helped the Israelis secure right. the nuclear bomb. Right? right. That confession occurred, and then all of a sudden he wins two Oscars. But um, his film uh, dealt with, a, you know, a terror attack and a plane hitting a Pan Am building. But yeah. how does that? In a sense, you say it, it's a precursor or in a sense a foreshadowing of 9-11, yeah. but at what point do you think this attack was staged and, as you say, for covering up what crimes? Like, what was, it, what was the intention of the cover-up the cover there? Well, um, they had to have the cover-up because in such, a, in such an atrocity, there are three levels that have to be controlled. You have to control the investigation, you have to control the interpretation, and you have to control the litigation. So the first one is you have to control the access to the evidence, because if the uh, if proper investigative forensic examiners were able to access the steel of the World Trade Center, like the steel of the World Trade Center, this is a place where about 2,700 people died, more or less. But 93 percent of all the people who died on 9/11 died in those buildings. But that's the crime scene where all those people died. They were it was literally an American Holocaust because they were being cooked alive above those crash zones. The people who were trapped above the crash zones were being cooked alive, mm -hmm. which is why so many jumped. But had, had that steel evidence been properly preserved and stored someplace and, not, and, just, and made available for a, a thorough investigation, then the true nature of the collapse would have been revealed early on. And that would have blown the whole thing out of the water because as we now know, um, nanothermite was found in the dust. Basically, all that was left of the World Trade Center after 9-11 was dust and steel. Mm -hmm. Okay, the, the U.S. government did some little survey of the dust, and they found that all the dust contained tiny droplets of molten iron, basic little, little balls of iron. Well, where did, that, where did that come from? That doesn't fit into the official version in any way, mm -hmm. because there's no way that you know, iron could be made molten um, in, a crash, in a crash scenario like they presented in their, in their books. Right. So... Um, and then the, the interpretation, we were given a false interpretation of what happened on 9-11 by Ehud Barak, Israel's uh, former defense minister and, and prime minister. He was in the London studios of the BBC World before the towers even fell. And he was uh, giving this explanation. He said, the world will never be the same. 
from today on. He said, we know who's behind this. It's basically, he says, it's Osama bin Laden. And we know where he is. And he said, now is the time for America to engage in an operational war on terrorism. And that little spiel that he gave on, on world television, BBC World, then became basically the takeaway from the whole thing. That's what everybody then believed from then on. That was the, that was, that was the Israeli interpretation of 9-11. It was there, I mean, it was what PNAC was calling for, the Project for New American exactly. Century was calling for, right? We need to basically take, uh, pray, we have to basically take onus of becoming the modern empire to secure the world, the world's policemen. We need a, we need a real Pearl Harbor, a new Pearl Harbor to justify it. Precisely. I mean, that's obviously the narrative of the war on terror, but for, you say going back, you know, for let's say a decade yeah. or two in terms of the motivation for this target, yeah. for these buildings, because yeah. again, we can say like, yes, kill, you know, destroying the World Trade Center has triggered right. the war on terror to the present day where we're concerned about ISIS terrorists that have only cropped up because of the war in Iraq and right. against Syria and you name it, like we're just in endless wars now. But the point being that why the Trade Center buildings, why these three, especially World Trade Center 7, because right. that one didn't even get hit by a plane, and it, they still demolished it. So something must have been in there that they wanted to cover up. Well, yeah, the, the OEM, the Office of Emergency Management of New York City, they had, the, they had a hardened bunker on the 23rd floor. The entire 23rd floor was a hardened bunker with uh, you know, resistance to every nuclear blast even, I mean, basically. And um, that, I think, is probably where the people who pulled the push the buttons on 9-11 that caused the demolition of the towers, they probably worked out of there. Then afterwards they had to destroy the evidence again. Mm -hmm. But the thing was is that in 1979, the, the founding head of, the, of Mossad, his name was Isar Harel, in 1979 he predicted to an American visitor, um, a Zionist, a Zionist uh, mercenary, what do you call it, uh, evangelist, a TV evangelist mm -hmm. named Stephen Evans, or Michael Evans. He told him that in, in, in 1979 he said Arab terrorism would come to America. And when it does, they will, they will attack your tallest building in New York City. Because he said, under, for the Arabs, that's like a symbol of your fertility. And he made that prediction in 1979, and mm -hmm. 22, year, 22 years later, it came true. And, you know, in my book, Solving 9-11, I, I, I go to the historical, I start from the history. And I explain how Israel has done this kind of thing before. I explain the motivation. I explain also how they were setting up the crime. Well, you talk about false flags, for example, how they have you know, are notorious for being able to create sort of, whether it be the Palestinians, for example, creating yeah. terrorist groups or networks that may either ultimately, like Hamas, for example, many people say yes. was originally, uh, in a sense, uh, not necessarily ceded from Israel, but they did allow yeah. Hamas to operate out yeah. of Israel proper, right? Yeah. And, and ISIS, a, ISIS, or ISIL, mm -hmm. or IS, Islamic State, mm -hmm. you know, it's... Um, for example, all the videos we're seeing now, well, first of all, false flag terrorism has now become the new norm. After 9-11, that's the big, that's the seminal event of our time. But afterwards, like the, the recent events in Denmark and in Paris and in Kenya, and in, you know, many of these attacks, most of these attacks are more of the same, false flag terrorism. And so what I recommend to, to viewers, your viewers, is that they read Jean Le Carré's book, The Little Drummer Girl. Because in that book, it was written with the help of the Mossad. They explain in the 1980s exactly how Israel sets up such things like the Paris shooting or the Danish shooting and, and how they do it. And 9-11. I mean, for example, the, the six, uh, or six or seven of the, of the so-called Arab terrorists who were living in Florida all had duplicate licenses issued in their name. You see? So somebody else was going around town leaving a trail in their name. And, and that's what Little Drummer Girl is all about, how they do that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, now when we see Islamic State committing atrocities week after week, day after day, what's interesting to note is that all of the videos, the video evidence, is coming out of one little Israeli website called Site Intelligence Group. I think it's based in McLean, Virginia. And the woman who runs it is named Rita Katz. And she was on CNN when the second American beheading video was shown on TV. Mm -hmm. She told on CNN, she explained that it just so happens that we we aired this film before the group aired the film because we had a copy beforehand. Well, how did they have a copy beforehand? You know? Good question. So where do the Saudis fit into this? Because, I mean, apparently, mm -hmm. according to the 28 missing pages for the 9-11 Commission, there's Saudi, Saudi financing that's going into the operation. Mm -hmm. where, would that, where would they fit into the 9-11 into the oper operation? Well, with all due respect for the Saudis, I would have to say they, they're kind of like useful idiots. They've been played. 
Um, they, they may also be, um, of course, willing to go along with some of these things because... Um, I don't think they would oppose, I don't think the Wahhabist no. mentality would really object to the use of terrorism to right. spread and, their and they, and they are And they are supporting, as we know, they are, they are supporting Islamic State. Mm -hmm. They are supporting these, uh, these mercenaries and these, these rebels that are fighting in Syria. Going back to the Taliban in the 80s, right? Yeah, and, they, and they, they are, you know, they're dead set against Iran and Hezbollah and the Shiites. So, you know, but, but they, the, the Saudis, when you talk about those 28 pages, I don't know what those 28 pages say, but when they talk about Saudi involvement in 9-11, that is not consistent with all of, the, all of the information that I have found, is that at the architectural level of this crime and the managerial level of this crime, the people who ran it, thought about it, conceived it, and then managed it, they're all Zionists, mm -hmm. not Saudis. So, as I said, the Saudis were probably played or used or just useful idiots who, who were able to be, you know, be, be snookered into a position where they look indictable. Right. Like right. they look culpable. Well, but I think even above the Zionist level, you still have what's the British Empire, yeah. which is a, still a tactical, you know, how do you say, it's a, ta it's a tactical machine. Yeah. You know, the British Empire is uh, the one that formed Israel in the first place, is the right. one that created these, the Saudi uh, Arabia, because Arabia obviously was not under Saudi control before the British gave it to them. Right. It, you know, basically established the modern Middle East. And so their tremendous architects, going back to Bernard Lewis and his arc of crisis policy in the late 70s, Right, that Brzezinski bought into when right. they when they formulated the, the the Afghan war against the Soviets. Right, the idea we can use this radical Islam against this is historical British policy against any kind of sovereign nation state, with be it USSR, be it China, be it um, mm -hmm. Assad now in Syria, or you know Nasser and Sadat in Egypt before. Right, so it's a very um, to me it's a British imperial policy. Mm -hmm. that plays well into the Zionist, let's say, worldview. But when you look at the British imperial policy, you have to look at who's behind that imperial policy, and you, you do find um, the fingerprints of uh, the Rothschild family, for example. The Balfour Declaration, which created the state of Palestine, mm -hmm. was basically like the birth, the birth certificate for the nation sure. in 1917, uh, was, was addressed to Lord Rothschild. Yes. And, um, you know, the, the Rothschilds, they had their own interest there. They wanted to create this Jewish state. They wanted to protect the, Su the Su uh, Suez Canal, which they had invested in and owned. Um, but it's, it's uh, when we talk about the British Empire, who exactly are we talking about? That's, that's what I'm pointing out. You know, because um, you know, the, 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 British, the British have been snookered in the same way that we've been snookered into wars in the Middle East that are not in our national interest. And it's not in Britain's national interest either. Well, again, that's the problem with empire. You yeah. lose your national interest when you become an empire, yeah, right? That's true. the whole point, is that you get caught up in these games that really destroy your nation, your industrial policies, for example, that might raise your working class. That all gets destroyed in the process of building But you empire. have to look at who's, who is the brain behind the empire. Like, for example, now we have this Ukraine crisis. Mm -hmm. Well, how do we get in this Ukraine crisis? We got into it because of, of the actions of uh, uh, Newland, Victoria Newland. Her, she's married to Mr. Robert Kagan, Kagan. Mm -hmm. who brought us the war in Iraq, basically. The PNAC document you referred to that said that the United States should invade and occupy Iraq whether Saddam Hussein is on the throne or not. That was in 2000, right? Mm -hmm. Well, now she comes along and she's, she's the one who brought us the crisis in, in Kiev. She, brought, she, she supported it. And then so she they said... Put, they had been pumping, pumping billions, right? Into right. The and two weeks, two weeks, two weeks before... Two weeks before the government was overthrown, the elected government was overthrown, yeah. she was already naming who would be the vice, the, who would be the prime minister. Yeah. So, I mean, it's like, this is, a, this is not an American empire. This is a, a, an American empire with a foreign brain, if you will, with a foreign agenda at the top. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very destructive of our nation. It's destructive of everything this nation stands for. And, and we are enslaved. We are enslaved to that deception that began on 9-11. And if we don't, if we don't, free ourselves from the, decep the deception of 9-11, if we don't understand that this is all based on deception, then we will remain enslaved to it. And that, it means nothing good for us. You know, those people that died on 9-11, on there were thousands of people who died, 3,000 people died. Um, more and more will die as a result if we don't free ourselves. It's in, our, it's in our absolute best interest as a nation that we expose who's really behind 9-11 and, and make, bring them to account, mm -hmm. you know, justice. And I'm, 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 you know, I'm encouraged by the fact that um, Minister Farrakhan in Chicago, Nation of Islam, has started speaking out about, you know, the Israeli role in 9-11. Because he's the first religious, high-profile religious leader to talk about it. 
You know, all of our institutions have failed us. The media, the government, the police, the, the universities, the churches. I wrote, a, I wrote a letter to the Pope. I told the Pope, you just have to tell the people that we've been deceived about 9-11. That's all. I mean, how can the churches go along with this deception? The deception is killing us. How can they go along with it? Well, I would argue that don't forget that the Catholic Church also has a tremendous role and influence because Israel itself sits where the Crusader Kingdom used to sit. Yeah. So, to me, actually, um, a lot of this policy is actually is being foisted by a much older empire, which is called the, the Roman Catholic Empire. Mm -hmm. You know, and again, I'm, I don't, I don't look at it like a Zionist influence over the British. I think the British have a much older game that they play, and they've mm -hmm. used Zionism as one of their tools, just like mm -hmm. they've used fanatical Islam, just like mm -hmm. they've they've used you know our war parties. It's like, again, it's a game as old as empire. Yeah. But to get back to the the real sure. motivation behind 9/11, in terms of the towers. Yeah. So the target again being what exactly do you think in those three towers? Because we know, for example, that you know Euro Brokers and uh, Marsh McLennan mm -hmm. were, two, were, two of the, were two of the companies that lost over 500 people. Right. Out of a 3,000 you know, 3, 3, people dying, right. to lose that number of employees mm -hmm. indicates perhaps those were the marks yeah. and the targets, but why? Yeah, well, um, you know, one thing is that, as I said before, um, evidence of crimes, evidence of the big crimes of the 1990s was being destroyed mm -hmm. systematically. Uh, as we know, Rumsfeld came on TV on the day before 9-11 and said something like $2 trillion was unaccountable for from the defense budget. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the, what, the Dove missile... Zach, Dove Zachheim was the controller that Yeah, day, Dove Zachheim was the controller. And then the, the, the plane that hit the Pentagon went into, or the missile, went directly into the, the accounting office where that money was being, you know, sought, looked mm -hmm. for. So The books. Right? Yeah, the books. And, and the same thing, like, both airplanes went into secure computer rooms in the, in the Twin Towers. Um, as you said, Marsh McLennan um, went right into their computer room, the first one. And, but that brings, that brings up a whole other thing, because it, when we talk about Marsh McLennan, we're talking about Maurice Greenberg and Jules Kroll. And Jules Kroll, Kroll Associates, had control of the security for the building. You know, And, and uh, Jerome Hauer had worked for them. Jerome mm -hmm. Hauer then appeared on TV in San Diego on the, on the morning of 9-11, again blaming Osama bin Laden. Right, like the script was already written. The script was written, absolutely. Yeah. And when Philip Zelikow, when Philip Zelikow then um, was executive director of the 9/11 Commission report, he came to the he came to the beginning of the planning sessions with the with the myth already written out. With the, he's a myth maker, basically. Right. That was his specialty in college. He wrote a his thesis was uh, the creation and, and and maintenance of the public myth. And then he. Um, he, he gave us a myth, he wrote the myth, and all those bullet points, all of those uh, points and titles and subtitles of that myth were already on paper before the people even started talking. So you see, that's... that's so you mentioned Mar Maurice Greenberg, who's mm -hmm. AIG, right? And AIG yes. people not know from uh, the financial demicle in 2008, but AIG has a long history with, with uh, CIA and, mm -hmm. and other covert yes. operations because the insurance always has to come into play at some point. Yes. In our world, what, what's their role, do you think, the AIG factor in this whole thing? Well, it's, it's not so much AIG, I don't know, it's, it's more um, Maurice Greenberg. Maurice Greenberg is, uh, is a very big supporter of the State of Israel, and as, as Jules Kroll is. And, um, you know, we saw in 2008, AIG received a $180 billion bailout. From the, he was the, his AIG was, were, were insuring, basically, Goldman Sachs and Bank of America. Mm -hmm. So the money went to AIG and then to Goldman Sachs and Bank of America. But the, the thing is, is that, you know, the secure computer room um, of both Fuji Bank in the South Tower and Maurice um, Marsh, Marsh McLennan in the North Tower, these computer rooms played a, a role. They, they were obviously from the picture, you know, in, behind you, you can see that the, the computer rooms basically exploded. Um, and left a, a huge, big, giant trail of white smoke. Well, that is not, does not fit with burning kerosene. That is evidence of thermite. And so my book, 9-11, I look, I look at the history of Israeli false flag terrorism, the history of Israeli attacks on American and British targets, and then the crime itself, and the setting up of the crime, and then the cover-up of the crime. Right. The cover-up is the, is the ongoing crime. You see, 9-11 is an ongoing crime. The crime happened on September 11, 2001. But ever since then, they've been maintaining this web of deception around it and basing policy on that deception. 
Oh, it's, it, I mean, that's, that's the one thing that they've done very well, obviously, is to buy, once you stage an event, as you say, a false flag terror event, mm -hmm. you have to immediately declare war. Because mm -hmm. by diverting the attention to the, right. e the, the other enemy, you never have time to stop and actually assess the original Precisely. crime to say, wait a minute, this was a false flag from the beginning. Precisely. And why did, why did Bush and Cheney not commission a blue ribbon investigation panel on day one? That is their crime. You know, they should have, they should have started investigating this if it, if it were truly a crime that we didn't know who did it and we had no part of, or our government had no, you know, part of it. Then they would have, they would have begun the investigation that day. Right. And they would have called out, they would have pulled out all the stops and found out who was behind this and what happened. Yeah. But the fact that they didn't do that indicates that it was a cover up. That, from well, the very beginning. You talked to Andreas von Bulow in yeah. writing this book. Now describe a little bit of who he is and yeah. what his conclusion was. Well, he was, um, I left, I was writing these articles in my little home in Schaumburg, Illinois, um, in October, September, October, and November of 2001, as the country was going to war. And I saw that the government and the media were giving us this really false narrative. And all the evidence that contradicted that was being swept under the table. And they're going to war on that. And I said, how safe can it be for me to be here? So we went to Germany. I, I transferred and started working as a foreign correspondent in Germany after, after Thanksgiving in 2001. And the first person I met in Germany was basically Andreas von Bülow. I met him at his house. And he was the former German parliamentarian who was in charge of the budgets for the, for the uh, intelligence agencies in Germany. And I spoke to three, three people like him. And they all told me that it looked like a Hollywood deception they couldn't understand why a Blue Ribbon investigation wasn't happening. And, and Andreas von Bülow explained to me that in this kind of operation, there's an architectural level, a managerial level, and a working level. And the working level is part of the deception. So like the 19 Arabs, for example, who were on the planes or not on the planes, whatever, these, the false trail of these 19 Arabs, that is the one part of the deception. But the managerial level, you would, you would find people like um, Alvin K. Hellerstein, the judge in New York, who oversaw the, the tort litigation, in which all 3,000 cases were settled out of court, there will never be a 9-11 trial. All the, the victims', victims all the victims' families were settled out of court. Mm -hmm. even, the, even the 100 families that held out mm -hmm. for a trial, they were all settled out of court. Right. And, um, and of course, um, Michael Shertoff, he's the, he's the head cop. How do, you, how do you sue the head cop? But in any case, he was the guy who was supposed to prosecute the crime. There was no 9-11 trial. There never will be. Right. Because if there were a trial, there would be legal discovery. And we could ask questions like, how did these guys get on the plane? Did they get on the plane? Let's see the videos, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. What happened to the Pentagon video? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think I have to urge people to read your book. I think that there's much more information in there. Oh, but yeah. this is a good place to leave it. And, um, you know, I wish you, I, mean, I know that you're out of the country now because of some of the intimidation you face as a result of your research. Malicious prosecution. I was I was attacked by undercover police at my house and then maliciously prosecuted. And uh, so, but I, I, I the reason we left is because uh, there simply wasn't enough support for 9/11 Truth at that time. Right. But now there is. It's growing, and 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 people are getting realizing that that we are still stuck in this deception. Yes. And if we don't free ourselves from it, the future will be grimmer than the than the past. It'll be worse. I think it's becoming more and more apparent that 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 this game goes on until people can actually just, you know, call a spade a spade. Right. And uh, stop buying the BS. Right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for joining us, Christopher. Appreciate thank it. You. Well, there you there you have it, folks. Uh, a little slice into 9/11 reality. Let's hope that you check out Solving 9/11 and start to realize that the events of that day were not as they appeared on the TV screen. That was a tremendous magic trick that was played so that we can be in this endless war of continuous militarization of not, not only abroad, but also domestically. And it will carry on until we start to actually call out the criminals, the real terrorists that perpetrated it. This is Sean Stone signing off.